my name is Paul Wu. I'm the uh, pro group, programming uh, group engineering manager, new to the role, so I'm not used to it yet. I know most of you in my uh, previous life as the solution architect, uh, but uh, now I'm running the uh, Redmond-based uh, supply chain and manufacturing team. Uh, we are here to talk about uh, intelligent operations. Uh, this, is, this is indeed your last session at the conference, so hopefully we'll, uh, we're, you're saving the best for last, and we're going to end your conference with, uh, with a big bang. Uh, that's the, the uh, expectation. So I have my colleague here with me. Hey, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Arijit Basu. I'm a PM, and our team owns the uh, intelligent operations. It was earlier called connected manufacturing, so just they're both the same uh, in case you haven't entered the wrong room. Uh, so connected operations as well as uh, enterprise asset management or the, <coughs> the session we had today morning. So both of us kind of own these areas. So what we'll talk about today and we'll give you a, a walkthrough of what we've done so far is the intelligent operations or connected manufacturing for finance and operations. It was kind of a long uh, ask, when will uh, AX or finance and operations work with IoT? So today we have something. Uh, we'll also share some customer references and stories. We, we've already deployed this at some of our customer site. Uh, and we'll give you the roadmap of it <coughs> and the opportunities for engagement. All right, so, so I'll let Arijit first give us the overall vision and how does everything work and I'll uh, deep dive on the technical side uh, a little later on. Thank you. Yeah, so this is one slide you've seen uh, pretty much and I just want to spend like a couple of seconds on this because the digital feedback loop, uh, what you've been seeing for the last two days, plays also a very important role and philosophy out here because at the end of the day, what we are doing with this connected operations is we are sending out data, we are getting back data in, we are processing it, enriching it, and then pushing it back inside finance and operations to give insightful actions. So that's very, very important. So we have basically the data, you know, the information flowing in and the data is supposed to go out. So for customers, it's pretty standard, you know, information goes out, our products go out, customers use it, they get us feedback and how we engage customers. And similarly for the product, the people, and the operations. So we are going to be concerned with the optimized operations in this session and touching upon the transform products because in the supply chain areas in finance and operations where we both belong, uh, we have an over vision of how do you digitalize the factory of the future concept. That's a very common term which everyone's using, everyone wants to be there. Uh, so from our side, what are the things we are going to enable in the product now and going forward to enable our customers to have literally a factory of the future version of it? So traditional manufacturing, you know, very standard. You know, you have your logistics, your raw materials, execution systems, finished goods and warehouse. You know, you do a lot of things. We have capabilities in these areas in finance and operations. But there are areas or what traditional manufacturing supply chain lacks is the digital feedback loop. You know, today in, in today's world, you know, data is a new business currency. So this data needs to flow in. And with this journey, there are a lot of areas where a lot of data is actually flowing in with IoT, machine learning, intelligence. And in today's world, a lot of the data you use comes from outside the organization. And how this data is going to go ahead and impact your supply chain is very, very important. So things like inbound and outbound logistics, warehousing and manufacturing execution systems are these areas. <clears throat> so moving away from our traditional manufacturing, what would it feel like you could now see the flow of information across your devices, machines, your shop floor? Okay, what would happen if you could monitor your flow real time? At every levels of the organization, and I mean every level, right from the shop floor to the top floor like a vice president sitting can actually view near real time inventory information on the dashboard, on the screen. A production manager can literally go ahead and see what the near real time information is, as well as any quality anomalies that can impact the business. Because IoT is not about just collecting data, but how to merge the data with a business application and provide the users some insights and actions. For example, if a machine sends me a part out signal, just getting that signal and collecting it and doing a sum min max average really doesn't add a lot of value. Someone needs to take that data and then do something with it. For example, if you're getting a 
part out signal from a machine, the machine will never tell you what product it's making, who the customer is, what is the cycle time. Are you delayed or are you ahead? If you are delayed, what is the impact? So our objective out here in this connected or intelligent operations is to make sense out of the digital data, the timestamp, the binary data that's coming in from the machines collected over IoT Hub, merging it with the business data, and then giving users of finance and operations access to it so that they can make intelligent decisions. Now, there is a long, uh, very strong roadmap we have after this, which we'll share with you. But connecting the digital world to a record inside FNO is the hard part. So once you connect a physical machine on the shop floor with a record in FNO, which is like machine 1225 in some warehouse and location, once you have that done, then it opens up a lot of possibilities. So <clears throat> when we look at the intelligent manufacturing as a whole, to enable intelligent manufacturing, it's just not IoT which helps, but also there are a lot of other areas which as a whole, our supply chain team is actually working on. So you will have things like business model changes. So in today's world, people are moving from traditional selling to more of a product as a service kind of approach where companies like BMW and others are actually leasing out their cars. So it's actually not just a sales order and your inventory goes out. You still keep, have to keep track of inventory because it's more like a revenue model. So our financials will have to support that. Our sales orders and our supply chain will have to support that, as well as ensure that we have total connectivity to the goods and services which are out in the field getting used so that we can get telemetry data and increase the or improve the engineering cycles. Another key factor is with a lot of machines as you know, the rise of the machines, we have to enable in proactive maintenance. And that's one of the key areas which we have invested heavily with uh, an IP acquisition where we are going to release an Dynamics 365 asset management solutions for the back end of an organization. And with that solution, we are going to link it up with the intelligent things like IoT, so as to enable you to do predictive capabilities and cognitive capabilities. <coughs> The most important factor out here is the factory of the future concept. So the factory of the future concept is how do we automate what's on the shop floor? So if you look at things, your shop floor data, the data which comes out, whether the machines are connected or not, is very, very separate from a business application. So it's very reactive. So something happens on shop floor, someone has to go and update it. So those two are never in sync. So if you look at goods or parts being produced or raw materials being consumed, someone has to go and manually go ahead and update any business application. And it's usually done at the end of the shift. So if you have a four hour shift or an eight hour shift, your physical inventory on the shop floor is very different from what inventory you have in the system. So in between your production runs, if you have a machine down scenario and you want to replan, this discrepancy in inventory causes a lot of problem. And it's usually off. So these are some of the challenges or problems we are trying to address. We've been working with a few handful of customers and understanding the scenarios and I'll share the scenarios with you as well as give you a demo of what we have <coughs> to go ahead. Uh, now for the factory of the future, what we are doing, we are landing up with four big key scenarios out here. And uh, I'll talk about the scenarios in, in the next slide. But our objective is to enable a completely new model supported by finance and operations as well as the Azure IoT suite. Uh, initially, we will start off with IoT Hub because we are dealing here with industrial machinery and equipment. And then later on, look at models where we can look into an IoT Central or any other kind of technologies. But initially, we will start off with IoT Hub because it will give us the flexibility as well as the capability of tried and tested in an industrial organization. <coughs> so, intelligent operations, shop floor to the top floor. Now, there are six scenarios we are going to land and this will basically be as a service. Service means, and uh, my colleague Paul will talk more about the architecture details on how we are doing it. So the six scenarios which we are going to line up is first one, notifications for delayed production orders. So what happens is when you actually do a production order and a job, you have a quantity, a theoretical start time and an end time. So you can find out what the cycle time is going to be like. So let's assume you're supposed to produce 400 widgets in four hours. So you know the theoretical cycle time that it's 100 widgets per hour. When you release it for manufacturing on the shop floor, 
because of micro downtimes or shortages of inventory, the actual cycle time coming in varies with the theoretical cycle time. And the actual cycle time is a summation of the part out signal which your machine sends out and you accumulate it over let's say a period of 15 minutes and then you can do. So what we are enabling is at a regular interval, the actual cycle time from the shop floor is being near real time compared with the theoretical cycle time. And if there is a deviation, let's say, and which can be configured by the user, let's say 10% deviation or 20%, it will automatically show a notification onto a workspace uh, and then related actions on that, which I will show you, so that the person can take intelligent actions. Now for this connected operations, we are considering three personas. The shop floor worker, where the worker will only see work doing done on that machine at that instance. They are not interested in what's happening on a different work center. The production manager or the shop floor supervisor who needs to have an overall understanding about that shift, that warehouse or that plant. And then there is the VP of operations where they are more involved or interested in overall equipment efficiency. <coughs> so initially what we are doing is we are focusing on the shop floor worker persona and the production manager persona. <coughs> so for the notification service for delayed orders, we will have a notification for the production manager as well as related actions. Because if there is a delay in production order, current job, it's going to impact all other production schedules which are there on the machine. So what is the customer impact in terms of value? Because IoT just today cannot give you that data. It cannot tell you what the customer impact is. We are here to solve that problem. The second scenario, what we are going to do, and both these scenarios have actually been deployed at one of our pilot customers, uh, discrete manufacturing, and uh, you know it's kind of we're running with their machine. <coughs> so notification services for equipment down. So typically equipment doesn't go down. It's just that the production has stopped because of micro downtime, because of let's say raw materials not being available at the entry point or the worker has faced some quality issues and things like that. So these basically like our production stops. Now what algorithm we have here is, you can define in the system like, hey, if this work center does not produce a part out in say 10 minutes, it means like an alert to me, someone needs to go and look at that. So we can bypass or flip over the micro downtimes, which can happen for a minute or less than a minute and look at areas which a production manager should get involved in. And this is one of the touch points, we are integrating it with the asset maintenance solution so that a work order or a maintenance request can immediately be generated and created or created in the asset management solution. So you can have a technician look at that. And this is something you can you know, have it at a global level or at a resource, individual resource level. The third scenario we are doing is mainly for one customer, which is our pilot customer in the food and beverage industry. Uh, it's quality anomalies. So you have a batch order, a quality batch order, and you have batch attributes where you can define, let's say you're making fries, like normal French fries and things like that. And you have defined quality parameters like my salt content in this should not be between, between X and Y. Moisture content might be between A and B, and let's say, the color should be something value. Okay, now typically what happens is there's a quality person going to the fry line or the chip line. They take a sample, test it out, and then say, okay, this is not good. We have to throw the entire batch away. And it happens usually like every couple of minutes to maybe a half an hour or an hour. So there's a lot of wastage. So what we are doing is uh, this customer, this pilot customer, they have, uh, uh, tied up with an optical sensor company, which is sending live data of the salt and moisture content from the fries. And we are real time kind of collaborating or checking that data with finance and operation because that's where you set your quality attributes. And the moment it goes out of order, it'll immediately flag a warning to the shop floor worker as well as the production manager, like there's something wrong. So action can be taken immediately. So we are literally reducing the value of checking every, you know, like 15 minutes or 30 minutes down to literally like seconds, 30 seconds kind of time frame. So the wastage, what you are planning 
is basically getting reduced drastically. So we will be expanding the quality scenarios to discrete areas as well, <coughs> and things like that. The fourth scenario we are doing is inventory update. Again, this one was very specific about uh, the manu uh, discrete manufacturing. So what happens is when you get part out signals, someone has to create a, a report as finished journal, okay? Now with this service, we will be able to take that data, accumulate it, and automatically create report as finished journals in the system so the worker or the manager can review it and then post it. So it will stop the need for creating RAF journals manually you know, at the end of the shift or in between shift. Now we'll also take care of serialization. So if you are part out of your products have serial number control on them and the IoT sensor or some sensor can actually give us that serialized data we will be able to also split up the lines with quantity one with the serial number so and populate the inventory journal for you. Now, initially we had wanted to go and auto post the journal, but some of the feedback we said was no, just create it. Someone will manually go and just post it up. But the main objective is reduce the time so that the inventory on the shop floor can be updated in the system. So the IoT signals are coming and we'll explain a little bit more about the architecture on what we are doing and how we are doing it so that your inventory journals can actually get updated near real time. <coughs> Asset maintenance, there are two scenarios which we are lighting. So the first scenario is whenever you have a machine down or any kind of event, we will have a configurable setup which will allow you to create a maintenance request or a work order on the asset management module. So if you have the asset management module for Dynamics 365, which we are going uh, general availability in October, the IoT pieces will be able to connect to asset maintenance and then auto create a maintenance request for you, which can then be routed by the uh, scheduler or the technician. <coughs> going forward, the scenarios for other asset maintenance are more about preventive maintenance. So when you're doing preventive or condition-based maintenance, we have something called asset counters. So counters is something that you want to measure on that asset. Let's say uh, an elevator, like how many times it has gone up and down before it is scheduled for maintenance. Or let's say a vehicle, like after 10,000 miles, so miles is a counter, you need service A. After 20,000 miles, you need service B. So today, these counters have to be manually inputted into the system. But with this capability going forward, we will be able to tie those counters with the data from the shop floor so they can be updated on an automatic basis. So for example, like if you have a vehicle and you have that vehicle connected and send the data sent to Azure IoT Hub, you should be able to pull that data and update it like every 15 minutes on what the total mileage is. If you have a machine and it's producing or if it's a conveyor belt which requires maintenance after every 1000 hours, you should be able to pull out the time the production machine is in use or that conveyor belt, update the counter so a preventive maintenance schedule can automatically be generated. So these are important things which we are investing in. And now with all the data that's going to come in from the IoT world, there's some part of the data which we will push into a data lake so that you can run your own analytics. Plus we will also have some kind of analytics and. Paul will give you a little bit more insights about what we plan because we are talking about big data. We are talking about industrial machines that have probably 300 sensors and they're sending data every one second. So there's, we don't use all the data in FNO because it doesn't have a business impact. So we only extract the data which has a business impact like quality parameters, error quantity, good quantity, bad quantity kind of scenarios. The rest like spindle RPM and all that stuff. As of now, we don't use it but we will going ahead, push it into a storage location where you can spin out your own analytics and BI. And as we move forward, we'll start using the data because IoT Hub has a expiration, I mean, the data retention is kind of seven days before you need to move it out. <coughs> the last scenario, again, is related to equipment health and machine health. Uh, it's very similar to overall equipment efficiency, but this is more on the long term. So. How do you measure the equipment health or the heartbeat that the machine is on and things like that? And what is the digital health of the machine? So using these counters and the IoT touch points, if your machine is connected, 
and the data is sent via the gateway into an IoT hub, we will be able to take that data and be able to define metrics on how do you say uh, equipment is healthy or not. And all of this requires the very basic thing is connecting your IoT sensor data to a literally a machine data. That's very, very important. So what I will do is uh, the architecture part is important to understand. Uh, so I'll ask my colleague Paul to explain it to you. What is the architecture? How we are going ahead with it? What are the capabilities? And uh, you know, any questions we can take after that? Paul. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Richard. Um, all right. So that was a really good introduction. Um, so I see a couple of heads nodding here and there. So I'm not sure if it's nodding of approval, acknowledgement, or maybe nodding from lunch. <laughs> so before I go into the architecture, let's, uh, let's do a fun exercise. So um, everybody, please uh, put your hands up. All right, cool. So for those of you, I want to uh, keep your hands up if you currently implementing or plan to implement ethanol manufacturing, production, asset management type of scenario. Keep your hands up. OK, thank you. Very good, very good. You're in the right room, right session. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Question number two, please keep it up. Um, for those of you uh, who are interested in implementing IoT sensor-based intelligence scenarios, please keep your hands up. Yeah, that, that was a trick question. If you, if you put your hands down, you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> OK, good. Uh, now, do you currently own or plan to own a uh, stream analytics pipeline. Oh, that was okay. pretty. That's good. We got our that's answer. That's pretty expected. <laughs> so let me interpret that question a little bit. Uh, yeah. So in order to do all these, uh, th that's a good time to uh, just bring go with the, the architect. Let's bring out the whole thing. Yeah. There we go. No suspense. Um, before I get into the detail, I need to give a big disclaimer. Um, this is still in public preview. Uh, we're private. still we're, private preview. Private yeah, preview. So, thank you. <laughs> in private preview, uh, the goal is to uh, work with a couple of customers. Well, we actually have been working with two customers today. Uh, the most of the stuff that we show during keynote, James's keynote, is actually live in production with Litten. Um, are we, are we going to show some live screenshots today? Or? No, I'll show the product, actually. OK, so cool. I'll, I'll show you what perfect, it is. Perfect, perfect. Um, but a lot of these architecture components, which I'll get into, it's still uh, you know, uh, uh, up to our interpretation and up to modification. Um, the reason, getting back to the last question I asked, um, we, uh, the, 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 the question I need to answer is, do you currently own a set of I'll say things like, there's multiple components involved in building up a stream analytics platform, right? First, you need to pump your IoT sensor data into something. Most likely, it's IoT Hub. That's one component. And then once data lands in IoT Hub, um, typically, only the sensory data itself does not make a lot of sense, right? It's just a whole bunch of numbers. You need to parse them, or you need, you need to enrich them with data coming from ERP, right? That's where we come in. After the data is combined uh, all into IoT Hub, then you put stream analytics platform on top of it to do aggregation or rule-based calculation to derive insights out of either the current batch window you're looking at or aggregation of the current batch window compared to a, you know, sometime in the past. So typically, that's how the workload uh, goes. And then after the stream analytics platform runs, the result of which we're going to ping it back to FNO as insights, either as alert or as some sort of an action the end user can perform. Now, knowing the end-to-end -end story, this is pretty much what this picture is describing. So we're getting sensory data from all the machineries, real life, real world, um, pumping all the data into uh, IoT Hub. In our case, the Azure IoT Hub. You can have an on-premise hub or a, another hub in a different cloud. I don't know. Uh, who has uh, AWS Hub? Good. Good. That was also a trick question. <laughs> well, no, seriously, who has IoT Hub today? OK. OK. Who has stream analytics platform like Azure Databricks or Azure uh, Stream Analytics? 
today. Okay, the same group. Yeah, that's expected. Okay, cool. Um, so you you notice this big kind of box circle here around the components we're shipping. Uh, the intelligent operation service is really the meat of what my engineering team is working on, right? Remember, this problem is really a data enrichment problem we're trying to solve. Because it's IoT not, yeah. sensory it's, data it's by itself, most of the time, does not give you all the insights you would need. The, 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 sizzle, the, the, thing, the part that sizzle is we are able to combine IoT sensory data with ERP data, like I described. Yeah, and this is a completely new service, which we are going to release first. Uh, and this, the magic sauce, as Paul mentioned, is how do you make aware the sensor data coming out from this instance is actually for customer X for this product and it's supposed to be delivered on this date. So that's the secret sauce. That's basically the bread and butter, the foundational elements of connecting both that pieces of data. Yeah. I'm sure for those of you who already own an IoT Hub or doing stream analytics, it's this exactly the same challenges and problems you guys are trying to solve as well on your own. Um, so our goal is to make that part easy so the rest of you who plan to implement the same don't have to go through the same exact challenges and problem solving process these guys might have uh, went through. Um, so we're shipping that big box. I can get into a little more details on exactly what's inside that big box. But in terms of all the uh, scenarios we're building, you'll see these little uh, black boxes over here on the other side. It maps uh, to the six scenarios that uh, Arija just walked us through. Yeah, and these scenarios can be deployed either individually or all together. So we've kind of compartmentalized them. So if you want, you can say, hey, I only need the delayed order scenario. Right now, I'm not ready to do the others. You can have the ability to go ahead and deploy individual scenarios as well. Correct. Um, I'd say in the next slide, we'll get into you know future plans, roadmaps, and so on and so forth. But from an architecture perspective, uh, who's heard of uh, the Lambda architecture? It's the same guys who had their hands up when they asked that, who owns IoT, yeah. So in the context of the Lambda architecture in the sense of stream analytics is with any sort of stream analytics, uh, there's always two paths, right? The hot path and kind of the cold path. The hot path is for I want act. I want to be alerted in real time or near real time fashion. For example, if my machine is down, if my pressure on my hydraulics is leaking, I need to be alerted right away because I need to go send a maintenance worker there to, to work on it. Um, but then there is certain uh, heuristics and insights you, you can derive, derive only from large amounts of historical data. And those data are called the batch processing. That's more of a cold path scenario. So for this phase, what the, all the scenarios we've been talking about so far mostly focuses on the hot path, path where we stream large amounts of information and we're doing real-time analytics with a stream analytics platform, right? And then the post part processing of that will come in phase two. So for example, for uh, asset management, the predictive maintenance, right? Instead of me just doing very dumb scheduling, every three weeks, let me do a maintenance so we, so we prevent, it, prevent a problem from happening. We can look at histor historical data and have a really efficient maintenance schedule that keep our machine up and running, so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, so let me dive a little bit more into exactly what's in that magical box that I've been talking about. Um, so essentially what that magical box is, it, we're taking data out of FNO, um, combining it with the data coming from the sensor. So that's one service that we have, currently have hosting. Another ho service we have hosting is the notification, what we call the notification service. Um, the purpose of the notification service is bring the result of the uh, stream analytics back to FNO so that we can surface the insights in the context sure. of FNO yeah. and so that you can act on it. This is very important to understand because you might have the question in the back of your mind, how this is going to plummet the system performance because you are dealing with a lot of data. Uh, one of the design decisions were to move the processing and the rule mapping outside FNO. So what we are doing is whenever you are doing an event, like starting a production order or things like that, we are sending a payload of reference data outside FNO, and the data from the sensors which is coming, we are processing it completely outside FNO. So that huge terabytes of data that are, uh, you might have 100 machines that's sending, 
It's completely operated on by the intelligent operation service. It does not go ahead and hit FNO. Only when an exception happens, a business exception happens, we are only sending that result inside FNO. Even, I'll show you the product, we have a streaming graph. The data from the graph is also coming out from outside FNO. For example, in one of our visuals, and I'll show you, we have the part out signal of a, pro let's say you have a production order which runs for eight hours. Okay, at the end of the day, you want to actually see the trend of time since last part out, which is a key metric for a lot of people. So we have the capability right now to show that entire eight hours trend inside FNO. And that means basically I have to somewhere get that data into a graph and show, we are doing it completely outside FNO. So in terms of performance scalability, we are only managing exceptions inside FNO, rest everything is being processed by this service which sits outside finance and operation. Correct. So this will give you scalability, this will give you performance, as well as you know all the other goodness of the microservices architecture. Exactly, exactly. Um, now the compute uh, against which we're doing stream analytics uh, that Arija just mentioned, um, that engine, it's, uh, today we're planning to use uh, Azure Databricks. I don't know if you guys have heard of Azure Databricks, yes? It's essentially Azure version of, a, of Apache Spark. Um, so that's a known, well-known platform, has a very healthy ecosystem around it, uh, performs really well, uh, scales really, really well. So um, that's the magic compute inside of that box. For scenarios like machine down, delayed orders, anomaly detection, we're using Azure Databricks to do the stream uh, processing. Yeah, and um, another interesting thing is when you set up, and I'll show you again, is the rules which you define, like when, where do you define a machine down threshold? Where do you define the quality metrics? Those things are now all inside FNO. So when you are configuring finance and operations, you can, you will be able to define like for machine one, two, two, five, if I don't get a part out for 10 minutes, send me an alert. For different machine, it's different. For routes and threshold settings, the settings are all inside FNO, very standard. We are not changed any of the existing thing. We've added just basic attributes. So the familiarity with the module does not change. It's very, very important to understand that. And that is the data we send out to be mapped with finance and operations and Azure IoT. Yep. Okay, yeah. So that kind of concludes the architecture. Um, there's a little asterisk here in terms of what exactly we're gonna ship um, by so the October, if you look at our October Wave 2 2019 release, uh, IoT Intelligent, Intelligent IoT mm -hmm. is, is, is part of that, because we, we had different names before that. Uh, so we need to make sure we're saying the right things there. Um, IoT Intelligent or Intelligent IoT is part of the uh, uh, fall release. Uh, the double asterisk there is says extensibility plan post GA. Um, extensibility means we're gonna ship all the scenarios Arija has mentioned, out of the box, right? You're not exposed, you own, own, all you have to do is own this Azure IoT Hub, right? That actually sits into customer subscription. Now we're, we're, we're gonna hide all the complexity of building, deploying Azure Databricks cluster, managing a job, deployment, de deployment of a job, all that away from you guys. We're gonna abstract the heavy lifting of bringing ERP data out, mesh it up with IoT data, and also putting data back, right? We're gonna hide all that complexity behind the scenes. Uh, the, the fact that we're hiding all this complexity makes extensibility story a little harder for us to design, right? So we're in the process of thinking on top of the SaaS offering we're giving you guys how exactly is gonna be the extensibility story. So for the partners in the room, um, rest assured, we don't plan to have a very closed system that on top of which you guys cannot customize. This absolutely we will have extensibility story. It's just phase one. We're not gonna have extensibility story for now. We're gonna ship with out of the box scenarios. And phase two, shortly after that, we're, we're gonna have an extensibility yeah, and, story. Yeah, and to be really true, we would be needing, we would be dependent on a lot of ISVs and our partners in the field because there are so many discrete uh, process and lean scenarios which can be automated. So as Paul mentioned, we'll ship some templated scenarios out of the box and then we will work with our partners, ISVs and, and you know, experts in the field and have the extensibility story so you can have something, a scenario very specifically for chemicals or very specific for food and beverage or very specific for lean. 
So that's the ultimate goal. That's correct. All right. I'll get back to so, you. enough talk. Uh, I think uh, I'm kind of bored you guys. Let's see it in action. So this is standard FNO. I'll just refresh it just in case it died. Uh, uh, standard out of the box market. Uh, I hope the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Okay. So what we are doing is we have some basic setup. So first of all, if I go into production control parameters, and again, the UI will change because this is a private preview, the name, taxonomy, and all that. So we'll have a new tab called connected manufacturing. We'll change that. And here we have a global threshold for machine down. So I'll walk you through some of the basic you know, setup stuff. In the uh, uh, resources, so if I expand that and I filter on, let's say machines, which I should have some here. So here we'll also, this will be enabled. So this is a downtime for a specific machine because based on your machine's age, you might have different downtime threshold scenarios. And then there are other setups which are very specific to a route because, and as well as the quality attributes and stuff. So the setup will be very, very similar to the system. Now what we'll also do out here is, this is the production shop floor management workspace. Very simple, everyone's seen it, you know, you've used it, probably got bored with it. But what we're going to do is, we'll have another tab out here. So once you enable the service, uh, it's called notifications preview, we'll have probably a better name for that once we move towards availability. What this does is, uh, we want to have, this is going to be an experience for the production manager, okay? Uh, the shop floor worker experience is different. They'll start off from the job card terminal and move forward. <coughs> so the production manager will have this enabled. And once they click on it, before I you know, move it, this is the place where the notifications are going to come, the exception notifications from IoT Hub and related to your machines and your production order. And from this notifications, you're going to deep dive to a detailed screen where as a production manager, you can filter on what resource groups you have a view and all that, very standard. So if I click on this, this is basically the notification screen. I will click on show details. Uh, now if I click on show details, it's going to take me to another screen where here on the left hand side, and I have simulated machines running in the background. Obviously, you know, our team doesn't have the budget to buy a multi-million dollar machine, but these are the notifications that you will see for machine down and order delay coming in directly from IoT Hub. So if I look at this job, something running on 1221 is delayed, you will not only see the delay alert, but you will be able to see the actions and related information. So the related information is how much was expected and how much you've completed. Very, very important. This order is for which customer? When is it delivery date? And we can add more details because this is still in a fluid. Because the magic is just by getting a part out signal, I'm enabled to correlate it with which production order is running because an IoT or a machine will never give you the production order, the customer order and things like that. Now the beauty is if you've seen this graph while I was speaking, this is kind of updates every 15 seconds. This basically gives you a time since last part out or and this is streaming data, which is coming live from a Redis cache, which is being fed from IoT Hub. So this is a very key metric, which a production manager would like to see is the frequency, because you really don't want to get a notification, you want to understand trend. Because if you're getting delays or alerts and notifications every hour, you have a bigger problem in hand. So this is the part we are showing. You also have the option to see the last one hour you have the option to see the last three hours and we are adding features to a concept of a shift level so you can see that. You'll have the option to take and drill down into a very specific, something unheard in FNO. Uh, you can find out as a production manager the specific time, what was the part out. So you have the flexibility of looking at the entire duration of the production order as well as the trend. So I'll just reset it. Now for this machine, change this. This is also going to give you the impacted orders which are scheduled on that work center. So we've currently done it as a 36 hour level, but we'll make it parameterized. So as a, a configurator, you can define like, hey, for the next, my, my time fence is six hours or 24 hours. 
show me all the orders. So if my machine was supposed to finish production like 12 and it's going on till two, show me all the orders that are getting impacted. So right from the screen, I have the option to reprioritize them, change the priority, I can reassign them, view the progress and even look at Gantt charts. So the dashboard for the production manager is basically seeing the notifications and this is a stop production, delayed orders. So we also have notifications for uh, you know, quality scenarios. And right now we have a create work order which is manual, but going forward for scenarios like this, you will be able to go ahead and automatically create maintenance requests or work orders for different scenarios. So we will make that configurable. So this is literally basically shop floor to the top floor where the screen is very simple. It's very familiar workspace which a production manager uses in FNO, but it's now enriched with sensor data and alerts and triggers so that you have much more intelligent insight. So it's just not a dumb notification is like error code, contact your administrator. These are actionable notifications which we are going to drive and going forward, we'll have a configurator where you can define the screen as well, something uh, not there previously in FNO. So this is basically the dashboard which the production manager should be able to see. Now the cool part is, obviously you'll get notifications, someone has to act on that. Otherwise, you know, you need to take them off your queue. So what do you do? So here, what we have here is, we have a close option so that when you have, and we will have an option called reactivate and snooze as we move along. So as a production manager, you see something, you've created a work order or the mechanic has gone and looked at it. You can literally go here and you can close a notification. We will have a reason code here as to why this was closed or why the problem was addressed. And I'll just say no. And here in the close notification, we will have a log of all the notifications that came within a specific job, like a production order what were the actions that were taken, who was it taken by, and what was the duration. So you can literally get overall equipment efficiency near real time. So your machine uptime kind of becomes near real time, and you will be able to leverage this data to come out with analytics, literally during a production order run, and then use it for any other kind of approaches. We will also link this notification screen with Microsoft Flow. So it's not only that you have to log into FNO to see this, this screen. So with the leveraging business events and Microsoft Flow templates, you will be able to redirect these notifications into a mobile device, email, or any connector that basically Microsoft Flow supports so that you have the right information with the right set of error codes and machine data to the concerned person, even if they are physically present in office or not. So this is basically what we are been working on for the last couple of months on bringing the first kind of cut on shop floor to the top floor scenario, where within FNO, we want to enrich the experience going forward. Now, coming back, so this is the first part. What, what do we plan to do moving ahead? So definitely uh, we will have the general availability and public preview of this. We already have two customers. We have a couple of customers who are in the pipeline. If any of you are interested in, in piloting it out, you know, just let Paul or myself know or drop us an email. Uh, we can meet you outside this. So absolutely happy to work on with this with you guys. So industry scenarios. So we will be working with partners ISVs on extending these packages like these blocks. We will have an onboarding experience which will be wizard based because under the cover there's a lot of work. So suppose you are a customer, we have to connect your IoT hub, we have to deploy the analytics. There's probably a hundred different things we do under the cover. We don't want you to do that as Paul said. We want to give you an experience of a wizard base so you, have, you can walk through like a five by five experience and then land industry scenarios. So we will be focusing on partners, ISVs, on lighting industry scenarios and process discrete and lean. So 
uh, if you would like to get in touch, absolutely please email us. Extensibility, as Paul mentioned, after generality, to enable ISV uh, or partner kind of engagement, we have to do the in, in extensibility. So extensibility in terms of service, extensibility in terms of the FNO component, as well as availability of the specific services like an app source or any other areas. So extensibility or the pro dev scenario, something we will be working on. Third one is the end to end experience. So we will be lighting up a lot of scenarios in asset maintenance. Uh, the key one is predictive maintenance. So predict once we have the sensor data and all that stuff coming in and dumping it into a data lake, we will be able to leverage power AI and Azure ML to run predictive maintenance models on top of that data and then push automatic work orders inside FNO. And this will be done using the data pipeline because if my machine part, the real challenge is identifying a sensor on a machine with what machine it is. So we are solving that difficult part so that you don't have to. The connected experience will be richer. We will be looking at uh, working with IoT Central. Uh, in some point of time, we will be looking at edge devices. We will be looking at uh, interoperability with the Azure Digital Twin so as to enable a much richer seamless experience with the IoT world and industrial IoT. And then last one is insight and intelligence. And as Paul mentioned, we will be taking a lot of this data which we have and we will be putting it into a place like a data lake or I mean uh, some storage which we will be giving access to you because we don't want to create all the reports and analytics. They're absolutely independent of every customer. So you will be able to go ahead and kind of make your own charts, graphs, and rich analytics scenarios using that data. So some of these basic scenarios, the areas, big investment areas, are something which we are going to work on. Uh, we'd, be, we'd love to hear back from you and also look at opportunities where we can work together. But I think from first of a kind, where our team's been working very hard is to light up the basic scenario of machine down, so IoT sensor, into Dynamics 365 FNO. So we have 15 minutes left, last session. I'd like to open it up for any Q&A and probably give you some time back. Yes, oh. Okay, so I think the lady was first, yes. Okay. The question is, what's the time frame for a public GA? So right now it's October, so the wave two 2019 re, uh, release. Yeah, yeah. So the plan is for July, we're gonna do a public preview. A controlled public preview end controlled. of next month, yes. which because we don't still, I'll be very uh, transparent with you, we don't have the onboarding experience built in. So our engineering teams will work with a handful of customers who are ready to do the public preview. So we'll keep it controlled, but absolutely get in touch with us and we'll have notifications and uh, announcements more on these. Uh, and then we are looking at a GA in October. Yep, GA date is October. Yeah. Okay, good question. So the question is that that box, blue box, is it going to be still a black box forever or are we going to open it up? So as Paul mentioned, for this year, October and a couple of months, we will keep it as a black box, yes. but we have to enable the extensibility and the pro dev story like expose APIs and stuff because it's a service. So there is, that's definitely in the roadmap, but not before October. And just to add to that, um, the scenario is not so simple. Oh yeah, I got my IoT sensor, I got my gateway uh, server, pump it into IoT Hub and you know call it good. because. A lot of the time, hardware vendors, they don't actually give you that telemetry information. You're not, you're not, you don't have access to those sensory data. They actually park those telemetry data in their own cloud. So sometimes we're actually talking to an API, right? So these are gonna be the learnings that we'll, we'll be gathering and getting in the next couple of months by working with some yeah. of you guys. And also, like, like when you're getting data into the IoT Hub, we need to have it in a standard format so we can do the mapping. So we're also working on that to have a standardization. Does that answer your question? Yep. Yes. For uh, when you increase the maintenance, uh, you will say it's work order, mm -hmm. but for the maintenance you will say it's replay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go to the yes. calendar. Uh, Correct. If, if, if you go 
Yes, we 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 will we will so we will yes, give. I impressive. mean, I interchanged. So the question is, when I do predictive maintenance, and you know, in 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 the near future, and we we create a work order, is it only that it's going to be a work order, or it can be a maintenance request as well? So the answer is, we are going to have an option to configure that Correct. yourself. So if it's a work order, do it. If it's uh, a maintenance request and what type of maintenance request it is, so it can be routed uh, to that way. So we we will give a configuration option. Yeah, it will be configurable. Configurable. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. 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 Yes, Correct. we will make it configurable. Yes. The way it's architected today, you can see you have customers have ownership of the IoT hub. Yeah. So if we, you, if you give me an IoT hub, which is your customer stuff, we'll be able to work with it. Now for the billing part, however, so that's something we will look after October. Or if you are doing work on that customer stuff, and we link it up with the asset management, and we'll enable the billing. But right now, what we have today is the customer owns the IoT hub. We just tell you, or we will tell you during the onboarding process that sign into Azure, we will suck up all the Azure IoT hubs you have. You can select one or multiple IoT hub because you might have many. And then it was going to go ahead and pull in the devices catalog, like the node ID and the application ID directly from that specific IoT hub. Yeah, Marco, I think your question really urges your good point. But Marco, I think your question is how do you build new scenarios on top of data, not only enriched with FNO ERP, but also from the third party application. Is that where you were going, right? Um, so um, yeah, today the way it's being architected, we only gonna work with our out of the box five, six scenarios that RIG has listed. But however, because the ownership of the hub really belongs to the, to the customer, there is nothing preventing the customer to say, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna deploy my own Azure Databricks cluster I'm gonna use, because I own the IoT Hub, I can connect to my IoT Hub uh, stream, and I can pump whatever data I, other, from other applications into the same hub, and I can do my own stream analytics, right? So there's nothing preventing you or the customers to do that today. We're just, all we're saying is, for the customers who says, I don't have a big IT team, I don't wanna get my guys to manage a whole bunch of Databricks clusters, um, I don't want to, them to le learn Python or Scala, <laughs> right? I just want an out-of-box experience Quick five, mi five minutes onboarding experience, light up my machine down delay order scenarios. This is what we're targeting today. But there's nothing yeah, for We'll start simple, and then we will open it up with extensibility and scenarios and deployable packages and all that, you know, bundles like business processes after VGA. Yeah, nothing preventing you to do the same, because you own the hub. Yes. Yes, so the data pipeline which you are doing, so the question is if you want to get external data in and can we plug that back into FNO for enhanced alerts like automatic palette creation and stuff like that, yes. The architecture we are designing on is basically, today we are mapping IoT data with FNO data. You, nothing will stop you from getting a third reference data into the mapping and then pushing back exceptions and alerts. Yes, Mark. Yes, so I, I'm sure there will be, but none of us worry about that. Uh, that was, uh, that's a very good question. I'd be lying if I didn't predict somebody asked that question, but yeah, we, we're not the best. There best will person. be something, definitely. Uh, we just don't know currently what the model is that our marketing and product marketing team and finance works with. The that. good news is here, uh, the engineering team is moving faster than the marketing team in, in this case. For a change. <laughs> so it's so an engineering change. driving project. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, any questions? Uh, uh. What you described in the IoT Hub sounds to me like a full blown management story of your accreditation and what you're putting into place after the fact to get a Honeywell and those full nope. blown nope. historians? No, no, no. No. So the IoT Hub is basically a hub that gathers IoT information. It, there's three things it, gu it guarantees. So, in terms of guaranteed delivery, right? Send only once, uh, 
at least once and most once guarantee delivery yeah. of any sensory data coming from on-prem yeah. sensory. It does not permit provide a permanent storage of all that information. Correct. It can IoT Hub can only store data for seven days, okay, and where it has to be then moved out. Now the beauty of is if you look at historian, yeah, that's nothing but a massive data warehouse. You're just pumping in data. What IoT Hub does is it is bi-directional in nature. So IoT Hub today can do cloud to device and device to cloud communication securely and do management of devices amongst other complex uh, stuff like that and interact with you know your edge devices and Azure Sphere and stuff like yep. that. Yep. So that's why we've taken IoT Hub and to the downstream of IoT Hub where you have the gateway and uh, the OPC connectors and servers and ultimately the PLCs and the sensors, we are completely transparent of that. You are free to adopt whatever architecture you have. As long as you get the data into IoT, you can use Kepware, Iconix, Microsoft OPC Gateway, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. We have completely transparent on that. As long as you give it in a specific format which conforms to a standard JSON file, which we work hand on hand with our customers, so we can take that data in and configure, we are good. Yeah, yep. IoT Hub good. is nothing but a, it actually is a event, Azure Event Hub underneath the hood. Yeah, so it's that's responsible for data ingestion and distribution, plus device to cloud, cloud to device, failover, and a whole bunch of things. It's not meant to replace. It'll only store data for seven days max before you have to move it to a blob or data lake or anything like that. What we are doing is we are taking the data from IoT Hub, we are injecting business data. Because that's very important, because if a signal of part out comes right now at this timestamp, I should be able to tell, hey, this is producing this widget which is there for this customer, and this is the job order, yeah. and this was supposed to start from A to B, and running on this resource. So we can now extrapolate that entire end-to-end -end life cycle of that binary signal that comes in from the machine, including finding out what machine it is, because you know the sensor, if I go a little bit technical, sensor will not give you the machine name or anything. It'll just give you a node ID and an application ID, and just by looking at it, you'll have absolutely no clue as to which resource this is in FNO. So we are doing all the heavy lifting work for you. We are doing the mapping, we're going to do the configuration. What we need is scenarios and support. Yes. Yes, so the question is, can it be integrated with a tooling service? So, so if I take a step back, this is the data pipeline, what we discovered. It helps you connect sensor signals to FNO. For the first scenario, what we are doing is we are taking those sensor signals from machine and connecting into FNO resources. If I expand your scenario, if your tooling equipment can give me data of tool usage in a specific JSON format. The data pipeline can map it now with not a machine, but maybe a, an item which might be a consumable or a tool, and then pass on the information. Because that's very similar, what we are going to do with asset maintenance is I can have an asset with counters, and those counters can come in from a car engine, it doesn't matter. What this data pipeline is going to do is, it's going to take an IoT signal, a specific tag and a timestamp, and link it with an asset or a digital record inside FNO. And let me ask a, just a clarification question. When you say tooling, are you referring to like the end-to-end -end management and maintenance of the IoT pipeline? Yeah. Like the telemetry, say for example, um, since this is black box to, to you guys, so I come into work today, the, I'm, I'm expecting to see that curve line. Instead of seeing a curve line, I see a straight line. Like, what happened? Where do I go debug? Is, is that what you're talking about? or? Right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, like we said, the plan right now is for us to ship this whole thing, whole experience as a SaaS offering, right? So we are responsible for providing the SLA for this service. If it's down, it's an ICM ticket to, to us. It's just like when your FNO is down, you send us an ICM ticket. But 
that is also a very good potential for an ISV or a partner to build upon because then they won't have to worry about the plumbing underneath it. It's just taking data from IoT Hub, mapping it with maybe a different entity inside FNO, and then updating counters or things like that. Because we've kind of kept it very loosely coupled because we want to reuse the pipeline, the, the connectivity, the real world, the digital and the physical pipeline uh, mapping uh, for reusability. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Oh, there it is. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so there's actually multiple aspects to that question. Number one is oh, how do repeat I the question. Uh, oh, yeah. The so question is yeah. um, how do I make sure the IoT sensory data that I have correctly mapped to, say, for example, the work order I have in my system? Um, there's actually multiple aspects to that. Um, one is the mapping. One is what the if the sensor? Yeah, sequencing. What if the data with any stream analytics? I'm always looking at the current tumbling window. What if at that time I received an event that actually took place in the past, right? How do I, do I aggregate it against my current window or do I aggregate it against the window that actually happened in the past? So this type of fundamental del guarantee delivery and win tumbling window type of uh, uh, scenarios now, is service actually is going to take care handled of by the underneath stream analytics platform, which is a good thing. Now going back to how do I make sure things over here is mapped properly to my work order that's exactly where the, the magic that we do. We are, we're, we're mining out the information coming from the IoT sensor and tying that back to, uh, basically during our onboarding experience, we're gonna have a mapping exercise between the nodes you have in, the, all the metadata you have regarding a work order and machines to certain parts uh, that would come from the sensor. So as long as you map things properly, it guarantees downstream when we do the stream analytics, things are getting mapped properly. We can only guarantee if, so, so, yeah. So basically how it works is today when you, it's all event driven, okay? So when you go to a production order and you click on start, someone has to click the start button. It's exactly at that time we take certain payload and then we push it outside. And then when you p finish stop on the production order, we also send another stop event which is outside FNO. So as long as the people who are actually doing their work in FNO do it in the right way, We'll do it. Plus, we also have considered edge scenarios. So if someone forgets, we even stop the production order and all that stuff. So we have we are budgeting edge case scenarios for that to ensure that you have the you know reliable data. But again, I can't give you a hundred percent guarantee, but we are trying it on, on, on two of our customers plus a few more. And we are going to build on the reliability and, and, and stuff like that. Yeah, we do have the job ID, we do have a start and end time of a production order or a work order. That's how we kind of correlate. Yeah. It's because time, if you want time stamp based, yeah. essentially. Because if you were to do it, we don't want partners and customers to spend doing heavy lifting. It's not their job. So we are going to do that for you. Okay. All right. I think that question scared half the room. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you very much.